One Strat's Tom Lee. Happy New Year. Welcome back. Happy New Year, Scott. Are you wavering at all by virtue of what's going on this week? Uh, we're not wavering, but it's clearly not a good start to the year. I mean, uh, you know, markets almost got to an all-time high at the end of last year, and the first four trading days of this year have been really terrible. Um, I mean, I can see what the market's struggling with because, as your guest previously talked about, you know, part of it is when the Fed cuts, and I think people are still jumpy about a strong labor market and if inflation is stiffening. But our base case still remains that, you know, we, we're going to see all-time highs in January, and then I think the market is tough in the first half of this year because of some of those things, but we'll, we'll overall end up strong by the end of the year. But you're not, you're not rethinking your own outlook at all by, you know, how, I mean, you obviously sound somewhat concerned by the, the way this year has started. Maybe it didn't go according to your plan. So how's that all factoring into your psyche? Well, yeah, I mean, I think it is disappointing because, you know, the, the year tends to play out in, in January. So the fact that we're, you know, sort of had a failed Santa Claus rally in the first five days is pretty important. And the market looks like it's going to be negative. Just tells you that um, the fundamentals, might, which, which have been improving, aren't necessarily going to convince investors to be buying stocks. So I do think it's telling us it's going to be a, a tough year. But the reason I'm, we're not wavering is that the, the reasons we think 2024 will be a good year for stocks has to do with the fact that the PMIs are bottoming and inflation's falling like a rock and the Fed has pivoted and is now managing a business cycle. I mean, those are really good anchors and supports for why stocks can do well, but you know, it's not a great start. I mean, it what might be, be much better if we were up for the week. Yeah, well, I mean, bulls would feel better. What about this ISM services report? I mean, I know you talk about PMIs, but is that concerning to you? Well, it's uh, there's there's pluses and minuses. I mean, to me, um, I think the ISM services employment number and you know the manufacturing number show you that the labor report we got today may not be as strong as it looks. And I think that's actually good because we don't want a labor market showing signs of rejuvenation. I think the trend there is is sort of softer employment growth. And from a prices perspective, I think it's pretty supportive of what we've been seeing, which is, you know, prices are falling. And as long as housing and, and cars don't surge, um, you know, housing growing at 3% is fine. That's consistent with 2% inflation. I think inflation is going to eventually be viewed as, you know, approaching target. And that's actually good. So, uh, Scott, you know, the data isn't always in a straight line. I think it's a little messy this week. And I think it is disappointing to see. But... I think too many are going to be quickly turning bearish and then put on their hard landing or skeptic hat or the Fed hawk hat. And I think that's going to prove to be a mistake. So you, you, you look for about 10 percent out of the S&P, but more or less is what you think we're going to do from, from here. Uh, how many cuts do you need to get that? Well, you know, it's, uh, it's not as dependent on cuts as it's dependent on really inflation approaching you know, what we'd all accept as like, you know, close enough to 2% so that the Fed is no longer fighting inflation. So I, it's not going to be as important as cuts as really sort of the quality of, of the inflation data. And I think the second is that, you know, we do need to have a rebound in earnings and global growth, which I do think is underway. And, you know, as you know, inflation is normalizing outside the U.S. And when you have that combination of inflation sort of normalizing and real growth recovery, I mean, that's that's good for stock. So it's not it's not dependent on the number of cuts. Well, I don't know. I could almost make the argument that it's, it's one and the same. I mean, if, if you get the number of cuts that the market has seemingly priced in, it means that inflation has continued to move down rapidly towards target. And if you don't, it likely means that inflation has gotten a little bit more sticky than the bulls had wanted it to be. So it impacts the ability and the wherewithal of the Fed to actually start cutting rates and doing it nearly as many times as the market still expects. Yeah, I hear you. I think the problem people have is when they when they talk about cuts, they they're assigning singular drivers for it. You know, I heard someone say, well, if they make a lot of cuts, it's because the economy's in trouble. That's not the case. The Fed could be cutting rapidly because they've concluded that inflation is actually approaching normalization. And, you know, a nominal Fed funds at five and three eighths or almost five and a half percent of the upper end is not appropriate when you're at two percent inflation. I mean, that's three percent real Fed funds. At the same time, the Fed may not have to cut. The market could actually conclude this by seeing interest rates fall. So 
we could be in a situation this year where the tenure is at 3.2% and FOMC members may be wavering, but the stock market will rally because it knows the Fed is behind the curve and needs to cut. So I guess this is the reason why I'm saying the cuts aren't as important as really the quality of the inflation improvement. And maybe it's more important to see what rates actually do. Before I let you go, I want to ask you about Apple. I know you're still bullish on mega caps, but you don't expect them to outperform to the magnitude that they did in 2023. This stock has obviously not looked good this week. It's down more than 6%, variety of reasons. And we listed them earlier, downgrades, chatter about antitrust, et cetera. If the stock goes through a period of upset, as I asked our prior two guests, I want to ask you the same question. What happens to stocks? Well, it's, you know, Fang, the destiny of S&P really does hang on Fang because it's such a large weight. I don't think Fangs are sell this year because, you know, they, they actually derated over the last two years. You know, their earnings outperformed the stock price performance. But you are getting periods like this where, you know, people get nervous. Um, it's one reason why I, I do think the story in 2024 is going to be a lot more about small caps and and sort of some of the lagger groups, you know, financials are our, our, our number one large cap sector pick. But I mean, if I owned Apple, I wouldn't be a seller here. You know, their franchise and sort of returns on investment are still enviable. So, you know, if it's down 6%, but was up 44% last year, you know, I, I think people have to kind of look through that. All right. We'll leave it there. Tom, I appreciate your time very much. We'll see you soon. Thanks. All right. Tom, that's Tom Lee, Fun Strat. Okay, so hope you guys enjoyed that interview with uh, Tom Lee of Fundstrat. In the interview, they talked about Apple. And so I thought, let's take a look at the technicals. Let's see where Apple stands right now as far as price and where it's been in the past and where it looks like it's heading. It doesn't look too positive, guys. All right, so let's take a look at this. We're going to first start off with a weekly chart, then look at the daily and then 30-minute chart as well. So... As you can see, price over here, the 197.70 level, that goes back to July 17th of 2023. Price came back to that level on December 11th, okay, uh, that week, and found resistance. It did not break through that high. Instead, okay, the following week, it stayed under, as you can see here, found that resistance again a second week, and then the next week, it declined below that. And then we had that gap that took place. And it was a, a pretty big gap, actually, because if we look at the price here, you know, it was like a 2.46% gap. And then this week, as you can see, we dropped 5.19% here. Uh, so it has not been looking good. What else am I seeing? We're looking at the Ichimoku indicator. And one important level that we want price to, to be above is the Kijinsen and the Tenkinsen, and it's not. So price has closed under both moving averages here we also see that this white line here that's called the chiku span that gives us a sort of a little bit of a um it's like a canary in the you know in the mind that tells us like hey there's a, some problems that are about to take place when you see this white line which is essentially the closing prices in the line form okay projected 26 periods in the past when you see that actually close under price that's a huge bearish signal and notice how before that point we had this it was always above price and so that's one of the elements of this indicator now we do still have some support below we do we are above the kumo cloud and so that's very positive for the weekly chart but notice how the the, the volume here went up okay so that's not good we don't like that and then also one more important thing here you'll see that the ADX has turned down from the move up, it's turned down and it's becoming now negative. We're getting plus DI getting below the negative DI, which is moving up. So that's also very negative on the weekly. All right, so let's now flip it to the next time frame. So this is for long-term investors, okay? And then the, the daily time frame would be more for active traders that are trading on a day-by-day -day basis. And so let's look at how the stock has you know basically performed over the last days now again this level is based on the weekly level the 197.70 we hit that all-time high and then it, and then price pulled back here and we are currently on the daily chart we are inside the kumo cloud so it's dropped and closed inside for two days now friday and thursday 
and here this is uh, Friday, January 5th, okay? And uh, a negative thing that I'm seeing here is that the ADX, this white line here, is moving up as the as price is moving down. So what this signifies is the momentum is increasing here on the daily time frame. Um, but we are getting some reversal candles, you know, multiple reversal candles. We're getting doji here. We're getting another spinning top and another spinning top. So, you know, could we find some support at the bottom of this cloud? It's possible. You know, we've had multiple days now. And so there might be some buyers that say, hey, you know, the price has come down enough. We may start to like, you know, buy this stock up at, at, at these levels. Personally, I wouldn't, you know, I like to wait until price is above the moving averages. I'm more of a conservative trader. And so I w I'm not going to take that, um, that strat. I'm not going to utilize that strategy. Um, so, I, and just real quick, let me show you. So price closed here on this little where it's circled. Price closed below the Kijensen, the red line here. The highs and lows of the last 26 periods. Uh, that took place on Tuesday, December 26. And then it just kind of stayed, you know, hovering here for a little bit before gapping down. Um, yeah, I don't like what I'm seeing on this chart. You know, it, if, if price breaks through this level, this, this Kumo cloud, then we can, we're looking at a significant drop. It could even get down to the lows here. And that's about, that's at 165.45. It's about 8.68% away. Let's look at this on the 30 minute as well. And here you can see, you know, each one of these bars that you're seeing here, these little green and red candles represents 30 minutes in time. And you can see the time frames down here, right? So here's, uh, here's 2024, right? And so it just, as soon as the, the year started, Apple just dropped. Okay, we see that big gap down. Uh, let me get rid of some of these um, lines for a moment. Okay. So gap down, once it got into the Kumo cloud here in the 30 minute, it just dropped, continued its way down and it's still under. Is this a buy point? Absolutely not in my book. Um, so there you have it. There's my analysis. If you guys like this video and want to see similar videos where I bring you the news as well as uh, do a little bit analysis on some of the stocks and ETFs that are discussed in the interviews then you should definitely subscribe. And there's a subscribe button in the bottom right-hand corner. Go ahead and uh, click on that, and uh, I'll catch you guys in the next video. Thanks.